Coming up on Tech News Today, Amazon's cooking something up September 6th. We'll make our best guess what it is. Facebook forces Android onto its employees, and the post-PC era gets post-PC ear. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, August 24th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones from your home or office. Find out what your gadget is worth at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Darren Kitchen. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we keep you up to date on the most important stories in the tech world, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the News Fuse. Or, there we go. The Apple Samsung patent case has a decision in Korea. I know, it's hard to keep track <laughs> of all the Apple Samsung patent cases, but in Korea... Apple has been found to violate two of Samsung's Wi-Fi patents, and Samsung has been found to violate Apple's bounce-back patent. Samsung was not found to be copying Apple's design. Under the ruling, Apple must stop selling the iPhone 3GS, the iPhone 4, the iPad 1, and iPad 2 in South Korea, while Samsung must stop selling 12 products, including the Galaxy S, Galaxy S2, and Galaxy Tab, but not the Galaxy S3. Amazon has set a press conference for September 6th, and sources say it's a big announcement. New Kindle Fire, anybody? Maybe. Rumors have also started swirling that Amazon is building a smartphone with Foxconn. In any case, we and TAT will be on the story, and we're going to do it live. So let's talk about that non-existent next iPhone and iPad mini. John Gruber posted his idea that it would make more sense for Apple to introduce the products at two separate events. One, the iPhone would be in, in September, iPad mini at Apple's usual music event in October. Well-known Apple journalist Jim Dalrymple wrote a response to Gruber's theory saying, oh, that Gruber's a smart fellow. <gasps> People are taking that to mean that Gruber's story or theory may be on the nose. Or maybe he just likes Gruber. Maybe, yeah, I mean, he, is maybe he just fellow. thinks he's smart. Yeah. He's Attention he's listener. Are you Joel Tenenbaum? Because if so, the federal court of Massachusetts is upholding uh, or upholding a 675,000 damage award against you. Now, he was accused illegally of downloading 61 or sorry, 31 songs and distributing them, which got him sued by the music labels. Now, the judge presiding over the case said that, quote, a rational appraisal of the evidence before the jury supports the damages award. Yesterday, Facebook released a new iOS app that got everybody talking about how much faster it is now that it's written in native code. Brian Chen over at the New York Times has a deeper report about Facebook and mobile, uh, saying Facebook's now making its developers use Android phones in order to help them better overhaul the app for that platform. The FCC has approved Verizon's $3.9 billion acquisition of 4G Spectrum from a consortium of cable operators. Another hurdle down for Verizon to build the LTE network it always wanted. The deal has to pass a federal judge still, but since the U.S. Department of Justice lifted all its objections to the deal last week, it's pretty much smooth sailing at this point. It looks that way anyway for not only Verizon, but Comcast, Time Warner Cable, Cox Communications, and Bright House. Congrats, all. Speaking of approvals, the International Telecommunication Union approved NHK's 8K Ultra High Definition TV standard. The standard, which NHK calls Super High Vision, means a resolution of 7680 <laughs> by 4320 with frame rates of 120 frames per second. If that resolution doesn't sound like anything to you, think of it this way. It's over 33 megapixels with 16 times the amount of pixels in a 1080p picture. Wake Eight, me up. the pixel is dead. Wake me up when it's over 9,000 horizontal. <laughs> anyway, Kodak, uh, Kodak is in dire straits. Get this, the company and? announced it's selling its film, photo kiosk, and commercial scanner business. Aww. After the sale of these businesses, though, uh, its digital and its digital imaging patents, Kodak plans to go ahead and focus on printing products and commercial packaging as part of its reorganization plan. Money for nothing. The Associated Press reports that eight judges from South Korea's Constitutional Court have ruled unanimously against a 2007 law that required Internet commenters to use their real names. The court stated it found no evidence the law helped decrease libel or, or the spread of false information, but that the law did discourage people from voicing dissent for fear of punishment. Security breaches that leaked personal data also contributed to the decision.
LG is keeping pace with Qualcomm with the teaser site, which is in Korean, but still interesting, for its next LTE smartphone. Promising a second-gen quad-core experience, the new device will promise better power management, graphics performance, and thanks to the Snapdragon S4 Pro chipset inside, that's what they have behind them. The site has room for five more videos, which, if they go up, should give us more of an idea of what to expect than the FCC filings alone. Friday, everybody. It's Friday. <laughs> Uh, what seat should I take? Front, back, <laughs> doesn't matter. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Gazelle. We've been telling you about them all week. Look, if you want to get some simple, easy cash in, in a legal way, uh, try gazelle.com. Go there right now. You can lock in your quote for 30 days. And in fact, if you've got an iPhone, you can lock it in for a little longer. Go go check it out. Look, there's, there's no reason not to. There's no risk to it. You can lock in that quote for 30 days, no risk. Uh, so you might as well do it now while you've got a chance to get more for it before everybody else goes. Because as soon as Apple makes any kind of announcement, which we're expecting in September, uh, there's going to be a land rush of people trying to sell their iPhones, and the price goes down when it floods the market. So go lock it in right now. Apple f iPhone 4 is 64 gigabyte right now. We're looking at it. 350 bucks would be your offer if you did it right this second. So go do it. Gazelle.com. They will give you uh, a locked-in quote. They will give you free shipping. Sometimes they'll even send you a box and, it, and it's really easy to tell them what your gadgets are. They even have pictures now. So you got no excuses. Go do it. You'll be able to get paid fast by PayPal, by uh, check, or even an Amazon gift card. They give you a 5% bonus for that. Go do it now. Gazelle.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Let's dig a little deeper into the stories of the day. Uh, real quickly, let's start with this Amazon press conference that's been announced for September 6th. Interestingly, in Santa Monica, California. Remember when they did the Kindle Fire? They did it out in New York, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they're not doing it in the Bay Area. They're not doing it in their hometown of Seattle. They're doing it down south of L.A., Entertainment industry headquarters. Mm -hmm. Is that where we're going with this? That's where I'm. That's what I'm thinking. A lot of people are thinking. Obviously, it's going to be new Kindles, right? And I think we would be shocked if they didn't unveil some kind of new Kindle. But would they? Would would they unveil anything else? Would there be an Amazon phone? Would there be an Amazon television? Or are they just going to beef up Amazon Prime and and have something brand new to show us for streaming movies and TV shows? Wasn't the rumored code name of the, like the 10-inch Kindle Fire going to be the? I think it was called the Hollywood. So that seems ah, like it's in line with this. Mm. This idea then that why oh, not do it in Hollywood. Well, it's by, it's near yeah. Hollywood. Maybe it couldn't get the space there. They didn't That's feel right. like it because you know the Kindle Fire. Santa Monica's kind of nicer anyway. Well, the Kindle really? Fire is a it's a budget product really. So they don't want to go too highfalutin with Hollywood. But uh, I'm thinking it's just going to be a tablet. I don't think they're going to introduce. Uh, I figure it'll be the 10-inch the Kindle Fire, probably a refresh to the Kindle Fire, uh, the 7-inch, and probably I don't see the the e-ink ones getting revised. Just yet, because it just seems like they just got revised, and there's really not a lot more you could do to the Kindle Touch or the Kindle uh, keyboard because they're pretty much done in design. What about something along the lines of original content, more original content that Amazon because might be working on? Because they do have on. that Amazon Studio, and they're going to be in a they big do. hangar space that is used as a studio. That's an, another mm. interesting take on this. Actually, both you guys could be right. I'm th I'm thinking no phone though, right? Well, are you thinking no phone ever, or are you just thinking no, no phone right now? No, not this time. Not, I, not I think it's a Hollywood-style announcement like yeah. this. Yeah. And would it be trying to go up against the YouTube channels, do you think? Like some, like, standing programming that would that, be That or a little bit more of original programming all on Netflix. Hey, here's some stuff we're going to roll out. Exclusive. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you, you know, get all your episodes on a certain day. And we've got this great new tablet for you to watch everything on. That makes more sense to me. There was a rumor a long time ago, before the Kindle Fire even came out, that the tablet would be bundled with Prime. Remember that? Like, the idea would be, you buy this this piece of hardware, you have access to all of the streaming movies they have, and then you're more likely to end up buying things on the, on the tablet. So I think uh, that would be really interesting if they bothered to, well, beef up their collection of videos. Because I think, just like recently, they've added a whole bunch more uh, movies and, and television shows to instant uh, video. So it's probably all gearing up for September 6th. They've been doing a lot of outreach and beefing up uh, to independent producers, uh, and, and they've been moving that along. They have this they have this program right now where they have people pitch them, they take those scripts, then they improve some of those scripts, and they put them into development. Maybe this is their big announcement, okay, these are the ones that have been in development that we're going to green light. And I wouldn't be too shocked if they had a big name on board uh, as well, uh, some, some big director or big producer name. Uh, to join in there as well. But I guess we'll see. Also, uh, someone in the chat room pointed out Santa Monica, not exactly south of Los Angeles. It's more west, west. kind of 
but it's like slightly. Of downtown, it's actually northwest. When but you, now we're splitting. Of hairs. downtown, so is it's, it? It's it's south of here. L.A. is Let's a big just, sprawling place. L.A. is my lady. No, it's not. I um, love L.A. You we just jump it. on the ten. You Except get the Dodgers, they say. All right. <laughs> let's, let's move on to Facebook. Uh, and why? What are they? What are they doing with this? Making everybody use Android phones? Well, they want to be a mobile company, and you say, "Well, what? That's silly." Facebook is already a mobile company. Well, I mean, they they certainly built themselves initially for the web, um, and Facebook is doing a bit of what a lot of people consider catch up as far as making their mobile apps. Uh, good, fast, offering what people want, being able to compete with smaller, uh, more nimble companies. And the New York Times has a great uh, kind of insider look on what's actually going on behind the scenes at Facebook with mounting pressure from investors now that they're a public company to be monetizing uh, their mobile apps, their mobile experience, which as far as right now goes, there's a lot less advertising uh, that, that you're seeing um, and more and more people are only accessing Facebook via mobile. And in fact, they have a new iOS app, which takes the HTML5 experience out of the mix. It's now a native iOS app. It's a lot faster. A lot of people are happier with it, uh, but not the same for Android. So what's the deal? Uh, number one, Facebook is basically building what the New York Times considered a mobile engineering army. So there's a conversion process. You're a programmer who, who's working at Facebook. Okay, that's fine. But you also now have to be a phone app engineer. So if you don't know anything about that and your programming is, is, is your, your strength is somewhere else, well, now you're going to be uh, taking some training sessions with all the other programmers who now also have to be iOS and Android and and, and Windows uh, phone developers. Uh, Facebook apparently has converted about 100 of its 700 engineers into engineer app hybrid robot people. Like I made the, up the robot part. Like, like the skin jobs, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's Nexus 6. That's, oh, okay. <laughs> right, yeah. Let's, let's hope there's more to it than that. Um, the next point is that just everything is mobile. Eyes. So if you build something new and cool that's going to be integrated into Facebook, well, there's a web portion of that and there's a mobile portion of that. There's no, so this is not, cool for the web experience, but mobile people won't get so, that. So they're not embracing the whole, oh, let's just make it HTML5 and it's the same experience on no matter what device you have, if it's you know Chrome on your Android or Safari on your iOS. Um, no, that's exactly why they got rid of the HTML5 uh, app experience on iOS. It's just not better. Um, it's more universal, but that's just not the way that Facebook is going uh, in the future. And it was slower. Ouch. Quite honestly. Or HTML5. The third, which Tom brought up in the news views that's interesting, is this idea of people being forced to use Android phones. And a lot of people who are watching and listening say, what's to be forced? It's the best phone. Right. I love my Galaxy S3 or whatever. No, but, uh, for, yeah, forced to use the Facebook version on oh. Android, which in, in itself is really, really bad. You mean the Facebook app on the Android? The Facebook app on Android. It's kind of pathetic that three tablet versions into the OS, they've never paid any attention to their tablet experience. It is horrible. Maybe so I'm ha really happy to hear this. By the <laughs> way. I can only imagine that if your code doesn't compile for like the third time at Facebook, they're like, you know what? Listen, you're getting the Android Facebook app for a week. Apparently, yeah. everybody, well, everybody and no TV. <laughs> Everyone's required. Let's say required instead of forced. Maybe that's sure. a nicer way of the putting it. The idea is, uh, as Jason said, food. the experience uh, using Facebook on Android is subpar right now. People who have Androids are like, what's the problem with Facebook? You have so many people working here. You have a bunch of really smart, talented designers. What is the problem? Uh, and the problem is, is that uh, a lot of people aren't actually using Android on a day-to-day -day basis enough to understand what the problem is, what the challenges are, how they make it a seamless, beautiful, it just works kind of experience. And so if you're using an Android day in and day out, then you learn what those challenges are and you can better code to overcome them. It makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, it does. It, I, I, go ahead, Jason. No, I was just going to say, it, it never really made any sense to me how, on one hand, they're so dedicated to mobile and that their numbers are so much higher on mobile than they are on the web now. I think recently that number kind of tipped over to where they have more users accessing on mobile than they do on the web, yet they paid so little attention to the web experience. And other people are like, oh, well, then just log into it through a Chrome browser and whatever. But that's such a pain in the butt. We shouldn't have to do that. If, if your power is with mobile, then pay attention to it. I disagree, though. Yeah. And here's why. Uh, it's not that you're wrong in the current way of doing things, right? Because the HTML5 experience isn't up to snuff yet. Mm -hmm. HTML5 isn't even a certified standard yet, right? right? So 
I, I, I get why an app is better now, but I don't want to have to download apps for everything. I was going off the other day about the fact that I always get like, wouldn't you rather be at our app when I was right. in a browser? I'm yeah. like, no, I'm on a browser I because I want to browse to the site. I would ideally rather have everything on the web so that I don't have to go through a mediated app store, so I don't mm -hmm. have to download anything, so I don't have to remember which button does what. That's what the web is, is good for, is like I get everything in one place or access through one app, but I don't have to worry about apps anymore. But I think what we're seeing is we're not there yet. And Facebook is like, well, that's what we were pushing for by doing HTML5, and it didn't sure. work. Sure. If you're an iPhone user, you may not have to install an app at all. With iOS 6, there's a lot of Facebook integration already. So the ability to share photos with Facebook or update your status with Siri, um, probably why Facebook is spending a lot of time investing in Android right now because, you know, meanwhile, Google's doing the same kind of push with their own uh, competing social network platform, Google Plus, into Android phones. So they really need to strengthen that side so that they don't lose, you know, that side of the mobile camp because they got, they've got Apple on lockdown, it seems. Yeah, I, I, I think that what we're going to see is is this continued reliance on apps to fill in where good web apps should be. In fact, one guy in the chat room just said, yeah, but when you, it's easier to get a quick glance on things through an app rather than through the web. And he's right. That's true, Sledder. But it shouldn't be that way. It should be just as easy. You should be able to design an interface on a website that's just as easy to glance through. You just need to auto-detect, and, and you need to have coding that can do all those things. What was it, like 2007, Apple didn't have an app store. They thought HTML5 is the future. You guys will write everything for this. There's no reason to have this dumbed-down, stripped-down web. They wanted to give you this option to go, oh, you just bookmark it, put it on your home screen. It's been five years, and that's still not cracked. To have a, to have a site appear the same on every single device at this point, the only thing you can do is set up an app because then you can control that in a, in a way that you're not worried about, okay, is it going to work with Chrome? Is it going to work with Safari? Are you going to use uh, Opera? Whatever browser experience you have, that could break the experience for the user. And that's the last thing some, a company like Facebook wants to go, what do you mean my site doesn't work on this thing? My app better be uh, much uh, improved because Android is, what, over 50% of the U.S. smartphone market. If they want to really satisfy these users, they have to work on this app. Yeah, and I think that there is no way to do, at least at this point in time, a web-only solution, just in that the, the app allows you to integrate with the phone more so than a website ever could. Just the ability yeah. to use those hooks to tie into the gallery so that you can notifications directly from there. Nobody wants yeah. to go to a, you know, a web page and click browse and choose the photos and up, upload through there, you know? You conceivably could have web apps use those hooks, though. You would hope. They're just not available right now. Uh, well, one thing this points out is that Facebook, like everybody else, is is trying to steer their company towards mobile because that's where everybody is. That's where the audience is growing. Uh, it's the post PC era, mm -hmm. and uh, we got some numbers from IDC showing that it's it's getting post PC ear. Yeah, IDC <laughs> says it's expecting 0.9 percent growth in the PC market worldwide this year. That's 367 million PCs to ship. That's the second consecutive year that growth's below 2%. And they, they cite things like slowness in Asia and mature markets, but also that consumers are considering spending money on other products uh, like tablets and smartphones while they're waiting for Windows 8. So you might think, hey, Windows 8's coming out, so that'll mean gangbuster sales, right? Because they're waiting. Well, apparently IDC is like, well, it's not really going to work that way because Windows 8 has some hurdles. You have to ex educate the consumer to explain, okay, <laughs> this UI that you've, you haven't seen, you know, the UI we've had like forever, Forget it. This is how this works now. So that's going to take a while. But IDC is a little bit more positive about next year with new versions of Ultrabooks and Windows 8. So I guess my main question is, you know, is, is the PC just kind of like waning in light of super powerful phones and tablets? Because you can do so much with these little devices that a full-fledged PC is becoming more and more niche. It's kind of like this, yeah, I can have, a, I can have a, an actual camera or I can have an actual music player but a PC is kind of like oh yeah great I can I can use that whenever I want or if you have one that's a year or so old and you're kind of ready for an upgrade you might be inclined to say well I'll get a tablet and then that's actually gonna take some of my usage off of the laptop or the PC that I'm using and so now I feel like I've kind of got this new cool thing but I didn't really need an upgrade to begin with. I mean, I think some people just kind of want something new and cool, but it's not necessarily that they need something new and cool that's going to replace and do every single thing um, as their current PC. 
Well, I think that the PC has its definite niche. I mean, you've got your programmers, you've got your hardcore gamers, you've got, you know, your professionals, video editors, stuff, stuff like that. But I don't think that having a new interface is some sort of hurdle for consumer adoption. If you look at, you know, Kindle, Android, iOS, BlackBerry, uh, you know, Chrome OS, Windows Phone, people have been able to pick those up no problem. And even with completely new paradigms of like gestures and swiping and things of that nature. So I don't think that that Windows, like, Flipping the table on the opera or on the interface is really going to uh, have a big impact on the adoption. Flipping I, the tiles. There's a yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Flipping the tiles on that. Yeah. Don't say metro. Uh, there's a difference between decline of dominance and death. This is not the death of the PC. Everybody's been talking about the death of the PC now for almost 10 years, frankly. And and what it is is certain uses for the PC are going away, right? If somebody just or wants just to branching out. If they just want to do word processing and read email, that used to be like, oh, well, you get a cheap PC. I don't think people are going to do that anymore. I think that's where a tablet is perfect. Like, oh, I just want to do a, a little browsing and a little email. Well, then you want a tablet. You don't need a PC. I find myself using a desktop PC more than I used to because when I want to be at my desk, it's more powerful. It has, it, it's always on. It's you know I don't have to think about the limitations because it's more you know it's got better specs than than laptops can have still. Uh, and I, and I can do video gaming on it that I can't do on the laptop. So maybe there's some some use cases that aren't the same as everybody else. But I think there's going to continue to be a use case for desktop PCs. It's just going to decline, and that's why we're seeing this number go down. I think as far as Windows 8 goes. It's a little early to call it a pattern, but we kind of see in every other thing going on with Windows. Windows XP lasted for a long time. Vista didn't really impress people. You can argue whether that was just because Vista wasn't very good or not. But a lot of enterprises didn't go to Vista because they said, you know what, we'll wait until the next rev. Then XP will be old enough that we have to switch. That may be going on with Windows 7. We'll see. They may say, oh, you know what, Windows 7 is great. There's no reason for us to switch. Why spend all that money? We'll wait until the next rev after Windows 8. And, and it may not be the Windows They'll get the Vista bad. people that didn't go 7. You know, they'll get the every other people that are on the odd cycle there, instead of the evens. Vista I'm joking about that. No, I, I think when you look at the bigger picture about, like, what is a computer and, and whatnot, um, the Windows 8 install base, you know, is going to look huge when that comes out because of the fact that it's branching out into that tablet. I mean, picture what if actually comes out and it's wicked cool and everybody adopts Windows 8 RT Metro tablet thing, whatever it's called. Um, then you have like a, a huge install base and, and it'll really spike the numbers. That's why I think Microsoft moved into that double interface for, for Windows 8. The, the fact is they're like, okay, tablets are where it's going to be at. And if people aren't using PCs the way they used to, we have to have an interface ready for mm -hmm. that other use case. Right now it's that kind of double-faced inter interface and that's the problem. So people are confused. But in the long term, I'm thinking like maybe Windows, like the way we're skipping cycles, Windows 9 might be the thing where everyone's like, oh yeah, that's a tablet interface. We know how that works. It's got tiles. It works. But that first time you show a, a huge change in your in your UI, that's going to scare people. Yeah. Wild Will says, right now I'm watching the TNT screen, chatting with the chat room, Skyping with my nan, browsing Facebook, and paracoding with my buddy in the UK. You cannot do that on a tablet. Well, Samsung's trying to do that with the Galaxy Note 10.1. They have that video player that goes over there. They're basically recreating. I don't really know how you can do that on any machine. <laughs> no, <right. laughs> pretty I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, uh, really? Window huh. Windowing is the future. <laughs> Multitasking might be the future again of tablets. Ooh, a Which... cascading desktop. Could you imagine? Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's get that on the tablet immediately. Uh, Friday seems to be a day for numbers because Comscore has got their uh, traffic numbers out there. No big surprises at the top. Google's still dominating. But what else is going on in that Yeah, report? so these are these are monthly uniques. Uh, the highly coveted top 50 sites on the web. Uh, Google is uh, at the top. And, and some of the, the, the websites uh, below Google are exactly what you think that they'd be. But what's interesting is that for July 2012, in the top 50 was a 38% traffic gain for... Or Instagram. Uh, between mm. June and July, Uniques rose from 16.5 million to 22.7 million, which doesn't actually put Instagram in the top 50, but it's almost there. But I thought everyone 56. was quitting Instagram because all the Android people showed up. No, actually, because all the Android people showed up, uh, the, the amount of people <laughs> using Instagram rose significantly, <laughs> rose significantly. in okay. the millions. Yeah. I also feel like, I don't know, maybe it's because people are taking a lot of vacations, oh, and yeah. so there are more pictures being shared. It's maybe the time of year for that. Plus, Instagram has uh, made significant uh, improvements to their permalinks. You know, if you if I tweet out an Instagram picture, now you can like it or comment it straight from that uh, web page rather than within the app itself as it was previously. 
Some other interesting numbers. Tumblr, for the first time, has surpassed MySpace as far Aww. as uniques. I can't believe it took this long, but Actually, it did. Yeah. Uh, Tumblr's July traffic was 26.9 million uniques, ahead of MySpace's 26.8 million, so just ahead, but did eke out, although MySpace is on the decline. Uh, it was at 29.3 million uniques, um, and Tumblr was at you know 25.5 in June. So if MySpace continues at this rate, uh, it'll be out of the top 50 even by the end of the summer. And one would assume that's probably that's probably something that you can bet on uh, trend-wise. Twitter up there at number 24, too. It just seems to kind of be floating up. Yeah, and you know who more else more. got into the top 10 is Comcast, NBC, Universal. Why? Olympics. Uh, that's not usual for them. That's actually a really, really high ranking. Uh, but that's, of course, because a lot of people were hitting up NBC uh, to see Olympic stuff over the last couple of weeks. But yeah, Instagram Instagram has uh, announced that they have over 80 million users, especially because you know of the of the Android app uh, release. They say near, nearly four billion photos are shared. Sounds like these numbers add up. Um, they're they're doing well as far as Comscore is concerned. Um, and yeah, sorry about that, MySpace. You're almost out of the top 50. I don't want to say end of an era because that's already happened, but <laughs> the era just. Keeps I, ending. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked, frankly, that they get <laughs> that many uniques per month. Um, well, I, I, even that, though it's on the decline. In all seriousness, that may be the fact that they did narrow their focus and and really uh, super serve a particular audience. That they've mm -hmm. been able to keep that audience that cares about music and and that new kind of MySpace, even if it's not for everybody. It's not massively popular. All right, time now to continue our tech collection coverage. <laughs> We take you to our tech collection correspondent, I as Akhtar, in the newsroom, yeah, right the next newsroom, to me. Right, yeah, right over yeah. here. So there's Tom. <laughs> okay. So Microsoft introduced its Election 2012 hub on Xbox Live, and it goes live on August 27th in the U.S. only. So what is it? An interactive television with a live polling system. It gathers impressions from Xbox Live users as they watch broadcasts. So if you're watching the debates... You can use your controllers or your sen your connect sensors to give a thumbs up or thumbs down as a debate progresses, and YouGov will compile that data to provide real-time graph of Xbox Live users' impressions of each candidate. So you'll be like, nope, eh, eh, eh. okay. And then Microsoft's saying right now that this is the future of television. They want to show the world what interactive television can be, and so with thumbs, with thumbs, <laughs> I, I guess. <laughs> can something like the Xbox, which is not a passive medium, it's something normally people are, are playing on, can that make inroads to make television, which has been passive for the longest time? Can it make television something interactive, or is that just like a pipe dream? Well, I love the idea of augmenting it. I mean, if if only the Xbox had or, uh, had originally shipped as like a pass-through HDMI device so that it could do like an overlay over an existing channel and then have some sort of way to know what you're watching and, and feed back into the tube, that that's wicked cool. You know, I think that might actually make TV engaging for me again because, you know, the alternative is sitting there with a tablet. Well, that's actually what Leo and I were talking about on, on iPad Today this week is the whole idea of second screens. It's like so many of us, myself included, have a really hard time watching TV, even if I just want to hang out on the couch for a couple hours without also having my iPad mm -hmm. or my laptop and maybe kind of half working or browsing around. So if you're going to be watching something, it makes sense for you know providers of, of coverage and people who are able to deliver you that coverage to try to contain that attention because they know that your attention span is bad anyway. So why not give you something a little extra to do while you're watching stuff that allows you to engage and then they get data from you? Yeah, I, it's one of those things that strikes me as a decision that sounds really good in a conference room when you're trying to come up with like, here's the problem on the whiteboard. People are using their tablets while watching. How do we get them engaged? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, well, give them thumbs up so they can vote. You know, all these things that make sense. But it seems like nobody ever does it. Like, even back in the well, tech TV the days, we were trying to do gold pocket and get you know? people to play along and do voting. Especially and for an election type of a thing, people tend to be really, really resolute in the way that they feel about stuff. So it's like, I can go ahead and thumbs up something, but do I really care what you guys think? Yeah. Because it's my opinion, right? 
I'm wanna, not sure what the aggregate data does for me. I like to see stats when I'm watching presidential coverage, election coverage, right? So the idea of ha using my Xbox, let's say I'm a cord cutter, right? And I, I'm like, oh, I can either go to YouTube Live for their coverage or I can, you know, I can go to Xbox for their coverage. That's a cool option for me to have. But what are they going to give me that extends my understanding of what's going on in the election? That's what's important. The thumbs up, thumbs down thing is an interesting stat for me to see if everybody participates. Like, oh, this number of people said this about, about this or felt, you know, no, they, they show they have those focus groups where they show the the positive feelings during the debate and then the negative feelings. That's always interesting. But what else? Like it doesn't have to be user interaction data as well. I want I I, I want to see analysis. I want to see interpretation. Uh, something that actually informs my vote. And Microsoft that, has, I want to they have partnerships with Rock the Vote. So if you want to find out how to register, you'll be able to do that in the election hub. Uh, YouGov is in there. Face the Facts is in there. NBC News is in there. So that hub is more than just that uh, interactive feature. But it, it's it's definitely it's definitely something that I could see Microsoft extending when Smart Glass is out for Xbox because then you do have that second screen and you're watching this election and you're probably more likely to start interacting. I think you're more likely to interact with a second screen than you are with a television. There's something about something far away from you. It's like, I'm not going to work with the television, even if I can do connect all kinds of wild motions. It doesn't seem like, it just it's just a bizarre tradition to not interact with the TV other than change Put a channel. Put a chat room up in front of the candidates while they're debating that they can look at and react to it in real time. Are you yeah, talking about I, putting the candidates on IRC? Yes. Do you have any idea what you're suggesting here, Tom? <laughs> Another town hall? Yeah, well, sort of. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, let's finish up. Uh, we mentioned yesterday on the calendar that today marks the one-year anniversary for Tim Cook as CEO. On August 24, 2011, Apple put out an announcement that Tim Cook was taking over as CEO and Steve Jobs was moving into the role of chairman at the time. In fact, we have our TNT breaking news coverage that happened. Remember that? They happened like near the end of the show. Twitter says One minute flash ago. Steve Jobs resigning as CEO of Apple. That is all the uh, news that we have about it. It's, it's unconfirmed. It's from Reuters. There's no link uh, to anything. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we just found it out this second. I has caught it Everyone is in the chat Twitter. Put it in there, so thanks, guys. Everyone in my Twitter feed is also pointing to Reuters. Now, we so don't... I'd we, like to hear this from now, Of course, it, it, we, we went on to confirm it. Uh, I think we found a Wall Street Journal or New York Times story shortly thereafter. Uh, and, oh, we all uh, look like freaks. I know, I know, right? Isn't it weird? One year ago today. I got bangs. <laughs> it was the right heck? after we moved into the studio, too. <laughs> so uh, everybody's been doing their look <laughs> back uh, at, at Tim Cook's first year. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do Every, before after. Everyone's been looking back at their, uh, their the first year of Tim Cook, and... Uh, uh, we, I've looked at Ars Technica, look at Gigome, Erica Og had a great piece up on Gigome, Jackie Chang had a great piece up on Ars Technica. Here's kind of the summary. Here are the things that changed for Apple uh, in the past year under Cook. They began a charitable donation matching program. Steve Jobs always resisted that. They began issuing dividends, the first dividends they've issued in 17 years. The tone of their ads definitely changed. You can argue whether it's for the positive or the negative. The Apple Genius ads that have been so controversial lately, the Siri ads with the celebrities. Things you may have forgot happened under Tim Cook. Uh, Gigaon pointed out, one week into Tim Cook's term as CEO, he promoted Eddie Q, who'd been working for the company for 22 years, to be Senior Vice President of Internet Services. He's now part of that inner circle. He hadn't been before. He hired John Browett of Dixon's in the UK to take over retail. A lot of people criticized that decision, say it's pretty uninspired, and began a fight against the Department of Justice, which continues against the antitrust complaint over ebook sales. In fact, most of the publishers settled with the Department of Justice, and Apple is fighting that settlement, saying it breaks their contracts. Uh, so taking an aggressive position there. Cook's faced some challenges. He's faced Foxconn controversy, the environmental policies. They withdrew from EPEAT, then they went back into EPEAT. Cutbacks at retail stores, again, kind of a, we're going to cut back at retail stores. No, we're not. Uh, there's the Samsung patent trial, obviously a big gamble for Apple, uh, and negotiating deals with the TV industry, which, you know, they were very bullish on, on an Apple television program. Uh, they were hinting around at it in earnings calls earlier this year. Now, today, uh, we have Eddie Q out saying like, yeah, don't expect something like that anytime soon. The industry just isn't playing along. Apple's also achieved a lot under Cook. They're the most valuably, valuable publicly traded U.S. company, stocks at $670 or so. Uh, what would you guys like to see in the next 10 years? Jackie Chang had a follow-up piece today 
uh, that she kind of surveyed the folks at Ars Technica about what they would like to see Apple do over the next 10 years. Uh, I'd, I'd like to get you guys' thoughts about that. I really like the um, Jackie Chang's idea of catering to power users. Like, I miss the idea of, uh, of Apple machines you know, saying, look, we do have great specs. Remember the old ads where they were saying their power PC machines were be better than Intel? They were, like, smoking those guys in the, in the rabbit suits, or whatever they were called. I forget that. Uh, but the idea was they were saying, look, we have better hardware. We have faster components. We can do anything. Right now, Apple has been so lazy and refreshing. Uh, notebooks and, and Mac, the Mac Pro, I mean, I don't know when was the last time they refreshed that. The iMac's kind of just lagging. And I would also love for the idea that, I don't know, serviceable computers, like I'd like to be able to take apart my machine again and be able to add things. But that's what I would love to change in this. But I don't see that happening. I'm going to second what Ayaz said and say that, you know, the, uh, Apple needs to dance with the one that brought them. Uh, you know, it was really the the Mac that made them, and sure, it may not be the money maker right now, but those are the influential people that made the brand that you're currently riding on. And so, things like the Mac Pro, where the you know professionals and like especially entertainment industry are using those things, the pathetic refresh that was the the latest uh, like bump in CPU number. That's it. Um, you know, need to go back to that. Even if it's not making you a ton of money, just throw a couple of engineers at that to dream and, and keep the dream of the PC or of the Mac alive um, because that's what's going to, uh, you know, continue that uh, that mind share that's, that's spreading. And, um, and also bring back the Newton. <laughs> just throwing that <laughs> out did. there. It's called the iPhone. No, no, I'm talking about the 5.3-inch display with right, the right. stylus <laughs> and the, the Your infrared Your pipe port. dreams with a gray scale are screen. not going to help Apple's market cap, both of you, I'm sorry to say. I, I don't see Apple, unless for some reason there are some catastrophic missteps over the next couple of years, their stock price tumbles and they have to totally refocus because Samsung has completely, you know, priced them out of the marketplace or something. Uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of talking about phones, but I mean, really... Uh, their their entire line of computers because they cater to the general public because so many people can use the products don't care that they can't get in and change the battery out themselves or tinker around that's what's made apple as um as profitable and as successful as they've been for for some people it it, it means that they're lazy and they're you know they're not um uh, honoring their their power users of your enough, but I don't think that that's where Apple's going in the future. What do you think should happen though? Where should they go? Well, I mean, they're doing really well right now. They need your help. They're Sarah. extremely. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, just keep doing what they're doing is a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't. I don't know. I I don't. I don't see doomsday for Apple anytime soon. I mean, they they have more money than they know what to do with. I, I think the next year is going to be fruitful for Tim Cook. I don't I don't think he's going to have a whole lot of problems. Fruitful. Uh, that is so good. Apple. I don't even know I'm doing it sometimes. Uh, but I do think they need a visionary. Uh, Tim Cook is very competent. He's proven that. He's very good at the job of CEO. But the one thing he doesn't have is inspiration. Uh, and, and he can get that from Johnny Ive. He can get that from Eddie Q. I think that's why he promoted him. Uh, and so I don't think Apple's in trouble. This isn't a huge criticism. This is a very minor criticism. But at some point, you need to juice that vision. You need somebody to step up and say, this is what the world should be like, and I'm going to insist on it. That's what Steve Jobs was best at. They've done a very good job of not saying, what would Steve do? And just continuing to do a very good job at being Apple. And I think that's what Sarah's pointing out is they don't need to change that. But that inertia will slow down over time unless you have someone to goose it, someone to shake it up, someone to revolutionize it. And I, I don't think that's an imminent problem for that for them. But it is it is a problem that they're going to face. And I, I'm not saying they don't have that person either, but I'm still waiting to see that happen. Well, that's what I'm saying is, you know, the dream of the PC is it does not feel nearly as alive as it used to be in the current crop of Mac Pros and even the, the PC side of things kind of feel uninspired and you wonder why there's a decline. I say that's an opportunity. Yeah, it, 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 it's a good way of putting it, for sure. All right, let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. You mentioned Microsoft's new logo uh, yesterday uh, and a lot of people have been debating what it means uh, that they changed their logo for the first time in a couple decades. What I like better is this Tumblr blog uh, that has come up with taking other tech companies and making their logos in the style of Microsoft's new logo. And in fact, some of these logos look pretty darn good in that style. There's, there's the Microsoft logo up at the top, but then look at Starbucks 
with the square green with the star, the Pepsi ones, they have both the old Pepsi logo and the new Pepsi logo look really good in that style. I'm not sure about the Apple one with the square Apple. <laughs> that was I little, kind of love that. That was a little odd. The Twitter bird looks really good all squared off like that. And what? I don't remember what this typeface no, is doesn't. called. You don't like that? I no, like that. I, I think not. the typeface is called like Helvetica. No, it's not Helvetica. It's, it's Helvetica-ish. I think the Olympics logo is a vast improvement on that hideous looking thing that they actually went with with the London Olympics. But I mean, it, it seems it just seems like people were ragging on that Microsoft logo because they're like, I could make this in paint. I, like, I think yeah, that's actually deal. the internal Google logo, the one with the blocks. <laughs> I really do. But um, but yeah, no, I like the blocks. What I love about this is I think the meaning is that Microsoft is going back to their roots and they know that they can actually make this logo with uh, the extended ASCII character set using... Um, Decimal code 219. So hold down Alt 219 over in DOS. You'll get that cube. You can do it in several different colors if you get a CGA or even an EGA display. So, so that's Microsoft's continue to support the oldest Microsoft users in the world. Eh, you know, I'm, I'm saying I think ANSI art is coming back. And <laughs> yeah. this is proof of it. <laughs> All right, let's check what's on the calendar, shall we? Next week, VMworld is starting Monday the 27th, and it runs through the 30th in San Francisco. More details at vmworld.com. And that's it. And that's it. Well, because, yeah, because we, yeah, we talked about the other stuff like Amazon and the Xbox Hub. So Yeah, there, there are other things that are calendar items, but yeah. that would just be beating a dead horse. On to incoming, dead item. No, incoming no horses will be harmed in the no, making of this show. That's not what we do here. Rob writes in and says, Your discussion today regarding the interview with Nintendo bigwig Satoru Iwata reminded me a great deal of the kind of posturing that went on with Sega in the early Dreamcast days, back then Sega assured their fans that they were going to remain both a software and hardware developer, and we saw how that ended up. When Mr. Iwata says that real gamers still want dedicated handheld devices, I can't help but think what he's really saying is, quote, if you want to play Mario, Pokemon, and Zelda games, you better stick with us and support us. Uh, in my opinion, says Rob, Nintendo's exclusivity with these properties are the only strong suit they have left at this point. Time will tell, but I won't be surprised if in the future we see people playing Nintendo-licensed games on other companies' hardware. I mean, the thing is, they need to sell three... Thinkable, three right? They need to sell 3DSs. They can't just say, the head of the company can't be like, it's not the future, um, don't buy our products, and we'll see you on an iOS device soon. Right, he actually has to say this, which is good, though, because it means that in order to compete, uh, you know, with, hey, the thing that fits in my pocket and has a great screen and graphics card and CPU, they need to make something better than, hey, that thing with the screen, the graphics card, and the CPU. Which, you know, they've tried. I mean, get, leave it to Nintendo to try some weird stuff. You know, the 3DS, the DS XL, the Wii. Yeah, the question is, will Power the glove. Wii U be enough to carry Nintendo forward, right? The Dreamcast was not enough to keep Sega as a hardware company, but the games were. Uh, and what this guy's saying is Nintendo's headed down that same road. The hardware isn't going to work out, and they're going to become a games company. I don't think so. I think Nintendo's got more, uh, more firepower than that. But if the Wii U was disappointing and the 3DS ta tapers off, it's going to be trouble for them. Eerily similar. The Dreamcast did have a second display on its controller, and it was a uh -oh. really cool mini device, and you could yeah. use it as its own portable Head console. Of, its time. of course, we always, go, we always go to the Tamagotchi when and we then, talk about the, the Dreamcast. I think that Ninten uh, Nintendo really has to, to do something innovative because right now kids are growing up with iPads and playing Angry Birds, and, you know, the kids are also Nintendo's core audience. It used to be like, oh, well, get a DS, give it to the kid, and then he'll, you know, quiet down in the minivan. Now it's give the kid your iPad, and or the kid already owns the an And so if you're all, you're growing up with that, you're not growing up with Mario and Luigi. Yeah. Next email from Robin Phoenix, who says, in response to your segment about people being underwhelmed with 4G, I'm a tech savvy guy. I've only had iPhones. And I don't feel like I'm missing anything. Websites load pretty fast. I have no problem streaming video. My impression of 4G so far hasn't been too inspiring after seeing several of my coworkers' various Android devices. I usually charge my phone every other day. They're constantly worried about making it through a single day, and sometimes they don't. The phones that claim to have solved the battery issue feel like bricks, and they tend to run hot. I'm more than willing to wait for technology to advance before getting 4G. Maybe September. <laughs> you know, all of my friends are getting 288s, and I'm, I'm just going to stick with the 14.4. It's working for me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't I, notice a difference. You and Rob are very patient. I'm using X modem, Kermit. It's good. I Actually, I, that's Were exactly what wait, wait. I did. I went from 14.4 to 36.6 because oh, I was like, when 36, the 288 came out, I was yeah. like, nah, I don't need that. It's 14.4 is fine. Yeah. 
Uh, but again, eventually 36.6 came along, and I jumped. So yeah. maybe 5G. Ooh, we'll I like that. Going. Every other site. All the exactly. Gs. Yeah. Bring like, more yeah, Gs. Yeah. All right, that's it for this episode of Tech News today. Uh, thanks, everybody, who submitted in our subreddit. Uh, it's one of our signals that we interpret when we decide what to cover each day, technewstoday.reddit.com. Get in there and uh, let folks know what uh, stories you like and even submit some stories of your own. Also, best of, uh, we're, we're getting closer and closer to the end of the year. So if you like particular parts of the show and you want them to be included in the best of episode at the end of the year, send it to TNT at twit.tv with the subject line, best of. Darren Kitchen, what's going on with Hack5? Oh, have you ever wondered about getting yourself injected with RFID tags? Yeah. Yes. Learn all, all about that in the latest episode of Hack5 from Tor Camp. That's where hackers meet nature and rave in geodesic domes and for a week. And nature runs screaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nature closes its ports. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Check it out, hak 5 dot. Org. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. Email address, as I mentioned, TNT at twit.tv. And give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back on Monday with an all-new episode. See you then. Gonna hold us. That's actually my official TNT dance. Is it official? Yeah. I did the, that once. The fingers up thing. I did this, yeah. and they're like, no, 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 no. That's your TNT dance. You Don't try you to recycle that, that here. <laughs> I like doing that, like the '30s dance. Where you're like, I like that you're not even control of the fact that it's your official TNT dance. <laughs> I, I know I've this. I've been now. told. The public has spoken. Yeah. They're like, "Don't bring your TNT dance here."